Welcome everyone, this is Richie. Now, we talk a lot about data-driven decision-making at DataCamp. And the idea of using data to back up your decisions is incredibly powerful and in fact, fundamental to good business. Unfortunately, it's one of, the, one of those things that's easier said than done. And to do it consistently across your company requires thousands of changes to tools and process and culture. So that means that today we're going to sweat some of the details in how you can change your organization to get better at data-driven decision-making. And our guest is Diraj Rajaram. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO at Mu Sigma. So Diraj founded Mu Sigma way back in 2004 to help companies make better decisions with data. So he's been working on today's topic for a long time. And in addition to his data leadership, he's been a very successful entrepreneur. So he was twice ranked in Fortune Magazine's 40 Under 40 list of influential leaders. And he was awarded the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year India Award back in 2012. So uh, thank you for joining us, Diraj. Thanks for having me, Richie. Wonderful. Uh, I'd like to dive straight into the questions. Uh, so uh, to begin with, uh, just can you give me an example of when you think uh, data-driven decision-making is a good idea? Uh, I think uh, for, most, uh, for most decisions that we make today, you know, we are living in a world where we moved from an industrial era to an information era. Um, the uh, you know this data being captured for pretty much everything that you can think of um, not using that to make a decision uh, would be a crime having said that um, how much do you um, you know how much do you uh, how, how much should you invest into you know uh, thinking of making a decision with data versus your intuition now that's an art as much as it's a science. Um, I still believe that there is value for intuition um, in what we do. Um, there is value to, un, you know, especially when you're asking, thinking about asking the right questions and how you interrogate uh, for what the truth is. Um, you know, so it's very, very important that you don't let go of your intuition. But having said that, um, looking at data is uh, becomes more and more important. And there's three kinds of data, the data that you have easy access to, um, and you can look at it very quickly. There's data that you don't have such easy access to. Maybe it's not in your organization. You need to get it from outside. And there's data that you may need to create. Um, and the value of the insight that you have, um, you know, is very different the more data you use. Um, and the more differentiated your data is. So um, I sincerely believe that the big D is not for data, but it's actually for decisions. Um, and how you get to those decisions become very, very important. And data is a big input um, in that journey, uh, but not the only input. Um, I think it's a, an incredibly important point, the idea that data isn't the be-all and end-all and that you do need some intuition there as well. So I'd love to get into that uh, in a bit more detail later on. But uh, just to begin with, uh, can you um, give us a success story? Have you seen any examples of organizations where they've developed that habit of using data for making decisions and they've seen some sort of benefit? We work with more than 140 Fortune 500 customers. Um, these include the largest retailers, software companies, uh, publicly traded insurance companies, uh, pharma and healthcare ecosystems. Um, and there's a wide variety of decisions that get better made because um, they are made around data. Now, um, I would say that the kind of decisions that you would make uh, could range from from a functional perspective, the sales and marketing area, to supply chain, to um, product, uh, understanding uh, risk, um, and a whole host of other things, which could be, uh, there's a long tail of stuff uh, around which data, you know, data can be used to make decisions. Uh, but I want to make this a little real for you. So we will actually take an example and show you an example of 
um, you know, uh, a, 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 of a retailer, um, um, you know, looking at, um, you know, a, a problem space and, uh, and understanding, uh, you know, how better, better decisions can be made. One of the, some, before I, you know, show the video to you guys, uh, I want to give you the backstory. The backstory is that this is a, you know, home improvement retailer, um, looking to, um, you know, better engage with a certain segment of customers. They call the, you know, the pros, um, you know, uh, and they, um, they want to better engage with them and they are looking at seeing how they can change that engagement model. Some of the uh, themes associated with uh, this problem will is that the initial problem that was stated was not the final problem that got solved. There is a journey of a problem statement as it becomes problem definition. Um, and that that's something which is which happens all the time in data driven decision making. So one should be very, very comfortable with that. The second thing is your world is not one or two big problems, but many, many small problems that are interacting with each other. That's how an organization's complexity manifests. So understanding how these interactions are happening become very, very important um, just to you know, um, you know, give you a perspective on it. If you have two elements like hydrogen and oxygen, uh, they could interact to give life-giving water or they could interact in other ways and it could be poisonous and make it hydrogen peroxide. So the quality of interaction of the entities really, really matter. So understanding problem solving as interactions uh, appreciating complexity becomes very, very important. And you'll see in this example, the use of knowledge graphs uh, and, um, uh, you know, graph theory being used. And the third thing you will see is the use of computer vision uh, to really capture, um, you know, data that you cannot, uh, that is not actually entered in your software systems or anything like that. But it's, these are real time data that's being captured. Uh, in a store and using that, um, you know, um, the analysis uh, and the insights become so, so much better. So you're, in this example, you'll see new kinds of data being created. Uh, and last but not the least, the use of uh, Raspberry Pis and Internet of Things, where you are... Uh, edge computing is being practiced. So these are all features that you will see in this um, video coming up. So I'd love you to play the video and then I can show you the kitchen behind the scenes as to what do we do to make the food, kind of, the kind of food that you will see now. So this is the food and, and after that we'll show you the kitchen behind the scenes. The retail store's professional customers are largely remodelers, installers, and contractors for whom the store provides a dedicated special services team. This team helps the retail store with multiple business aspects, primarily focusing on best-in-class service. This includes in-store experience, fast-in, fast-out, comprehensive assortment, and pricing strategies. One of the key initiatives as part of streamlining operations and serving the customers better is special desk transformation. The current special desk design is a bottleneck for a professional customer checkout experience and leads to a longer wait time. As part of the initiative, the special desks have been replaced by special pods to facilitate speedy checkout and enhance customer service. These special pods not only facilitate wait time and checkout time reduction, but also lead to better interaction with customers. However, what is the challenge? To analyze the effectiveness of the special pods, the team had to manually capture wait times and checkout times due to the lack of data availability and infrastructure. To overcome the challenges from manual counting, Mu Sigma developed an innovative solution combining cutting edge technology with the new deep learning algorithms in a low cost setup. The solution has enabled us to process similar information efficiently and at scale. We captured videos for the special desks and special pods from different angles for three test stores to capture customer point of sale metrics. A deep neural network model called Reinspect was used to detect humans from the video. This algorithm uses a recurrent LSTM layer for sequence generation. The model is trained to provide high accuracy for human detection with heavily overlapping instances. 
Since we only needed to detect the people who were making a purchase, we restricted our attention to the area of interest, namely the checkout counter, highlighted here in red. Additionally, the green areas represent a channel where people walk past the counter. After a human was detected, we leveraged the multiple hypothesis tracking algorithm to assign a unique identification number to an individual which was then maintained when he or she moves in the designated area of interest. This enabled us to now measure the wait time and checkout time of each professional customer without any manual intervention. Once this data was algorithmically extracted, it was used to understand variation in traffic and POS metrics over multiple days to validate the migration from desks to pods and to identify time slots that require further engagement from the retail store. As part of this solution with the focus on scalability, we were able to successfully deploy an in-house IoT device prototype in the Innovation and Development Lab of Mu Sigma in a specific city store to remotely record and store data without any manual intervention from our office at Bangalore where the results were processed and validated. The results of our analysis stated that the wait time and checkout time decreased by at least 11% and 12% respectively, which resulted in a decrease of at least two minutes in the net interaction time and a significant improvement was observed in terms of the ease of the checkout process of the professional customers. Building on the existing infrastructure, we can answer adjacent business questions in addition to analyzing wait times and checkout times. One such question could be maximizing impulse purchases where we could analyze customer buying behavior to strategically plan the assortment at the checkout counter. Another avenue of interest might be addressing a staff optimization problem where we can analyze peak hours and customer traffic to get insights that can help plan staffing better. There are numerous such instances where we can leverage the existing infrastructure to answer pertinent business questions. That was a really nice video because uh, I can imagine if you didn't use data there, then you're going to have all these store designers just arguing endlessly about whether desks or pods are better for customer service. And getting that data was the only way to really come to a conclusion about what you should do as a business to, to optimize those sort of customer wait times. Uh, so, yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, really nice um, uh, example there. Um, yeah. I'd like to talk a little bit about the, I want to make a, person, a point uh, here. Um, you know, it's data-driven decision, um, but it's not, data is not the end all. I sincerely believe that the journey is from data to dialogue and dialogue to decisions. Um, the, the presence of data and analytics and insights help the stakeholders, you know, have good conversations. And that those good conversations eventually uh, result in good insights. See, typically when an idea is uh, happens in an organization, that uh, there's a journey of that idea. There's a journey of that concept. It initially is an idea, it's a content. Then it goes on to become conversations uh, between people. Then eventually, um, uh, you know, based on those conversations, and the analytics around that, insights around that, all of those things, some decisions get made and eventually it goes into the compute environment. It goes into the company's software and databases and all the good stuff. Once that happens, that becomes part and parcel of how the company runs and it gets consumed by business at that point of time. So that's the journey of that concept. Now, you know, but to, to do all of this, you need, if you're going to make good food, you got to have a nice kitchen behind the scenes, right? So what I want to actually show you for this specific, you know, for examples like these, what would be an industrial kitchen that you would need to operate? So I want to maybe share my screen to make that happen. If you can help me bring that up uh, and let me know when my screen is active. Yeah, I can see that. So this is something that we've developed over the last, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, 18, 19 years of working. We realized very, very uh, early on that, you know, making 
you know the kinds of food that we want to make without a kitchen was becoming more and more cumbersome we needed structure in place why is structure important well structure is important because if you want to do more with less people you will need structure if you want to do more faster you will need structure if you want to do more in a sustainable manner you will need structure and last but not the least when you have a new problem that hits you that you didn't anticipate if you want to have enough slack and so that you have the bandwidth to solve for that problem you need structure so structure becomes really 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 important um, now this is an ecosystem that we the business exploration ecosystem that we've created that allows for structure to happen it consists of two parts one is navigating complexity understanding how things are connected to each other and how are they interacting with each other and the second one is achieving the transformation that you want to make you know uh, it's not you know making the decision then using that decision to come up with new technologies new ways of the business operating and re eventually resulting in better impact for that business so i want to start by looking at this we we fondly call this our inquiry engine because questions are more important than answers that's what we feel and in a world where questions are more important than answers you know how what's the science of asking a good question and you will see very very uh, clearly with technology evolving that uh, you know technology is aiding us uh and making it easier and easier to come up with an answer but asking a good question is still very difficult so uh, from that perspective we developed two ontologies for problem solving one is bottom up thinking for granularity and the other is top down thinking uh for outcome based uh, you know decision making now let me start by looking at the bottom up ontology here we call it the problem dna and here i just take one of those problem dnas and here is the journey of the problem there is a current state of the problem there is a future state there is a problem solver who wants to solve this problem and there is a solution consumer the business side who wants to um, you know have a solution but the initially the problem is never designed you know defined very nicely it's very muddy and fuzzy so you got to do some research but you have to have a very systematic way of doing that research so that you know everything surrounding you you know you're entering this jungle you want to make sure that you know the kind of jungle you're entering you know the kind of you want to anticipate some problems uh, you want to anticipate some wild animals coming in you know so that you're a little safer once that research is done you have a better chance of understanding what the gap between the current state and the future state is now you are ready to have a dialogue you want to not solve the problem all by yourself you want to be around other people around your community as you are solving that problem typically the business and the practitioner typically have a conversation like this and they say hey what are the factors what are the sub factors what are the attributes and metrics what are the questions for these questions what are the various data sources that i could have once this is set up in a very clean manner like this it allows for you to create a hypothesis matrix where the rows are all the questions and the columns are all the data sources and the interaction between the rows and columns is the interactions between questions and answers all insights happen at the interaction between questions and answers so this sets it up very very nicely for a granular problem state problem definition right so once this is done you know i go back and say okay i this allows me to get into the details be atomic but if i want to have a very i want to see the forest from the trees i want to be far more outcome oriented i have a senior leader in the company for whom i have to explain what i'm doing that we have a different ontology that we've set up where we can actually say hey you know what uh you know way one i'm going to do a certain set of things wave 2 i'm going to do certain other things and wave 3 uh, i'm going to progress towards a better outcome but in each wave what are the financial and business outcomes what metrics am i trying to change and how much am i trying to change it by what is the business willing to commit that they will change and where are the analytical insights going to come from um, now it's very important that you are able to learn about uh insights from multiple industries so we've allowed 
for the organization to have that perspective. So if you're a retailer, you know, supply chain, store operations, merchandising, you could go to pharma uh, and look at commercial sales, marketing, medical affairs, R&D. Uh, if you're in oil and gas, uh, looking at uh, material management. So all of these allow you to learn from multiple industries because there is something somebody is always doing better than you and there is something you can teach somebody. So that perspective is very, very important. And then the top-down thinking meets the bottom-up thinking here because everything below here comes from the problem DNA that I just explained. So the bottom-up and the top-down ontologies are established. And just with these ontologies and nothing else and using graph theory, we've been able to develop these kind of graphs, which tell you the story of how the complexity in the organization is, how you understand. It's not just about one problem, but it's about many problems that are interacting with each other. It allows you to see the problem space, not as stars, but as constellations, because it is in that constellation where you can have a holistic perspective and you can make a better decision. Right. So this, um, um, you know, uh, so this perspective of seeing the problem space as a network, all work in the future is going to be network, guys. Your algorithm is a network. Your, uh, you know, uh, your, your, your problem space is not one or two big problems, but many, many small problems that are interacting with each other. So seeing this becomes as a network becomes very important. And last but not the least, you want to be able to measure what you're doing in terms of a decision supply chain, that journey of that decision, all the way from business understanding to practice of analytics to business impact. Who is doing what? What's the, what's the practitioner doing? What's the business doing? Uh, and how are all these people collaborating? So this perspective, this, in, this kind of industrial kitchen is required. So as if you're a big organization and you're interested in solving, you know, problems and you want to move from anecdotal project to project analytics to programmatic decision sciences, um, you know, um, then you better have an industrial kitchen in place. Uh, otherwise, you are you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, scale, uh, which is going to be very, very important because there's no silver bullet around a decision. You gotta, you gotta see that animal from multiple angles, and then you kind of realize what kind of animal it is, um, and then you, that's the better way to solve for that problem. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I have many questions about that. I'm gonna ignore my previous questions. Um, so, um, you mentioned that there are sort of two um, structured approaches you can take. You can either take the bottom-up approach, which is starting with your data and then trying to work towards an outcome, or the top-down approach where you start with the outcome and then sort of work backwards. I, to I would how you say might... either or. I would say and. Um, you know, it's better to do both. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious as to when you would decide on one strategy over the other. Uh, well, you know, uh, I think... Uh, both serve very different purposes, right? Um, the bottom-up approach allows you to make sure that you're collectively exhaustive. The top-down approach allows you to move towards being mutually exclusive. Um, because uh, you, you don't want to boil the ocean when you're, uh, you're having a conversation with a senior leader. They don't have that much time. Um, and this, uh, And the world of data is such that uh, unfortunately for all of us, the rate of increase of noise is far higher than the rate of increase of data uh, or signals. So the noise to signal ratio is such that you already have too much noise. So your ability to synthesize what you're saying into um, what is very useful is going to become very, very important. So that allows us to uh, look at the world and say that, hey, here is the bottom-up perspective for, for solving the problem. But how I am going to, my approach towards decisioning is going to be guided by my top-down perspective. So one, both of them serve very, very different purposes. Ideally, we'd like to do both together. So the program is defined by the top-down perspective, but these all these individual projects are defined by the bottom-up perspective. So those, those two things achieve very different things. Okay, so really it depends on what sort of level you're looking at. It's like, are you trying to solve one of those individual problems or a kind of broader, I think you used the term constellation of problems before. Yeah. Okay, Yeah. nice. Think about, um, 
you know, it's a good question. That's why I want to, uh, you know, uh, add a little bit more. Look, your world of problem solving has three parts in it. There's inputs, um, various things that go on to the problem solving. It could be data, it could be the algorithms, it could be the technology, it could be people, um, you know, it could be the biases. All of these are inputs into that. Now they all think of them in terms of all the various raw material you need to make that dish, right? Um, and then there's the output, you know, what are you making? Is it descriptive analytics, dashboards and reports? Is it inquisitive? Is it predictive? Is it prescriptive? Is it, are you building an AI engine? All of those things are outputs, right? So you have many inputs interacting to create an output. So in, in, if you're, if you're, in the food analogy that we used, the output uh, could be uh, uh, you know, a, a pasta dish, it could be a salad, it could be um, you know, a lasagna, whatever you want to do, right? Uh, but eventually you want an outcome, right? An outcome is very different from an output. What is it going to do for me? Is it going to um, uh, reduce my inventory turnover? Is it going to reduce churn? Is it going to increase uh, my profitability? What am I doing there? What's the outcome? So the outcome is like, what am I, okay, I'm making all this food, but who am I making it for? And what's the event? And what am I, what's the, what am I trying to achieve? Is it like a birthday party or is it a romantic dinner? Uh, you know, so what are you doing that? What are you, what's the outcome for? So that perspective is going to be very, very important to move from inputs to outputs to outcomes. Thinking about it in that perspective, is very, very important. And that allows you to kind of, um, you know, guide yourself. And like you mentioned like uh, birthday parties or romantic dinner, like this is something you can use in your day-to-day -day life as well as uh, in your organization. Uh, but just uh, sticking to the, the, the sort of business context, I'm curious as to how you go about making sure that people can adopt this habit of actually uh, building data into this process and having this structured thinking around decision making. Because uh, often, uh, you know, just building up and adopting these sort of habits is going to be key to the success. So what's, what do you do to encourage that at New Sigma? Look, I think, you know, uh, we at New Sigma understood that the basis um, you know, of everything that we do comes from um, three perspectives that we have, but they're all connected to each other. All of these perspectives come from a world of creating abundance. Uh, you want, you know, problem solving not to be driven by fear. You want it to be... Uh, you want to, but at the same time, the fear is, is a very natural instinct because you don't want to get things wrong. Um, but a combination of fear and fun makes it adventure. So how do you make that problem solving process adventure, right? And, and for that to happen, you have to operate, um, you know, to create a world of abundance. And to create that world of abundance, the first thing you need to do is look at the world as learning over knowing. Because there's so much abundance in learning. There may be scarcity in what you know, but there's abundance in learning. So the, that approach of learning over knowing becomes very, very important. Um, okay, so that's your why, then what's, then what's the what, right? And from that perspective, we say that, you know, you better not be governed by what the experts are saying alone uh, and not be constrained by that. But you, or you yourself may not be the expert uh, on all topics. So there may be things that you will have to experiment on. So experimentation over experts, right? So, and the last thing is don't keep secrets. In this world, um, you know, the new IP I feel is interaction property and not intellectual property. So the more secrets you keep, the less interactions you're having uh, and the chances of having a serendipitous insight goes lesser and lesser and lesser. Now, what you will see is that the learning over knowing perspective creates a world of humility. Um, the experimentation over experts creates the opposite of that. It creates a world of irreverence. So you have to harmonize humility and irreverence. And how do you do that? How do you have the wisdom to harmonize that? And that happens through the multiple interactions I'm ha we are having. 
um, by talking to you i'm going to learn a little bit from you i'm going to tell you i'm going to be able to share some things with you that you may find useful um, and that that's where all the value gets created and all of these things that we are doing is enabling the people in the organization to have better interactions better dialoguing process and through which we will they'll be able to get to a decision even better I do like that idea that humility and irreverence are really important sort of uh, characteristics of a good sort of data-driven organization. Um, I think for a lot of organizations, they're kind of they're just getting started with this. So what's step one when you, when your CEO says, okay, we need to get better at working with data. How do we do that? Where do you begin? Well, I think, um, you know, yeah. Uh, most large organizations have already, uh, you know, been doing something in this area. So it's um, uh, so this may not apply to many of the large organizations. But having said that, you know, uh, you know, wherever you are, understanding the state of the union is going to be very, very important. Understanding the lay of the land, what is the investments you've made, what's the quality of your data, all of that is going to be very, very important. But it is Im- only impo- uh, you should you should while you should look at everything, every one of those reasons could be a reason to stall. And how you don't stall is basically leadership, right? Because clean data, good data, connected data is a utopian concept. It doesn't exist anywhere, right? So how do you move forward despite that? Uh, you know, so that's, uh, you know, so that's very, very important. And, and so that's that perspective once you've had, then the second thing I would say is, educating you know senior leadership about what the art of the possible is and you know starting the journey of them creating expectations for their teams saying that okay these are all things that we should achieve in data driven decision making in the use of ai in the use of predictive modeling in the use of uh, you know all of the all of these next generation technologies that are coming up um Last but not the least, you know, you know, as much as you're looking at making food, also build your kitchen. Uh, because if you're only focused on making food, um, you know, it's going to give you an immediate satisfaction, but it's not going to be sustainable after some time, right? So, um, so the, the how do you harmonize between solving specific problems and creating a better art of problem solving? That's going to be very, very important. Um, some of the more uh, advanced nuances, um, especially in a world of AI and generative AI and all of these things that are coming up right now, is an appreciation for complexity in your organization. Understanding how various entities are interacting, how you can represent those interactions, and then use that re- those representations to acknowledge the complexity and address the complexity and nudge your problem solvers to think as constellations and not as stars. Nice. Um, so you mentioned that you need to understand a, a sort of state of the union, like how good you are at uh, working with data at the moment. So um, how do you go me- about measuring that sort of level of data maturity and how do you know when you've become successful at using data? Well, the, actually the answer is you don't. Uh, you can just make progress. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's an ocean out there. So, um, so the best way to think about it is not in terms of destinations, but in terms of journeys and progress and saying, okay, am I doing better today than yesterday? So that's a better perspective I would have um, rather than saying that I'd like to get to a certain destination because these things are changing so much. Um, you know, the technologies are changing, the math is changing, the quality of data is changing, the business concepts are changing. Uh, we are living in a world of uncertainty and how one responds to that uncertainty is going to be very, very important. Uh, and and therefore, you know, not having very definitive perspectives as to this is the where I want to be uh, is, is also, it's, it's a healthy practice, I would say. Um, you know, so that's how I would go about it. Um, but, you know, there are, you know, many organizations, uh, you know, uh, that can that can help. We are one of them. But there are many organizations um, like us who are helping large companies 
think about this and building a horizontal capability in decision sciences. Um, and uh, I think the future of decision sciences is by being a horizontal. And, uh, you know, it, and hopefully it will touch every part of your organization. Because if you are a, uh, if you are a company, your customer is not going to look at the problem as a marketing problem or a supply chain problem. He's going to be looking at the problem as a problem for him. Uh, and, uh, and he's going to point your company saying that, look, you need to solve this problem for me. Um, so you've mentioned the term uh, decision sciences a few times. Um, I think a lot of people here will have heard of data science, but decision science may be a new term for them. So uh, can you just explain what's the difference uh, between data science and decision science? I got to take a step back for that. So first, let's start with, um, you know, um, data engineering, right? So, and I'm going to try to um, put it in kind of layman terms because it helps me think about it. So, um, you know, uh, data engineering is like uh, making sure you know where all your data is, uh, are they healthy and so on and so forth. That's like your refrigerator, you know? That's kind of where you put your food and you know you know where your vegetables are, where your milk is, where your eggs are, where the freezer is, what's the freezer use for all the good stuff. That's the refrigerator. And you're getting better and better refrigerators right now. So that's good. Um, you know, moving that moving your data from one refrigerator to another refrigerator doesn't make you have better food. Right? So <laughs> so so that's that's the first part of it. Then the interaction of all of that with, you know, math, with techno, you know, technology, uh, you know, understanding, all of that helps you get to this perspective of data science. Now, data science could be, um, you know, descriptive, uh, you know, and now there's a big difference between analytics and data science also. Analytics is just uh, coming up with that data and, uh, you know, and like coming up with metrics and all of the good stuff. But data science is a little bit beyond that where you also come up with an insight. So this perspective allows you to say that, okay, you know, um, what, what are the various kinds of data science? It could, uh, you know, it could be descriptive, dashboards and reports telling me what happened, inquisitive, uh, why something happened, predictive, what will happen, and prescriptive. Um, you know, uh, so what do I do about it? And so on and so forth. And with recommendations and all of those things, that's data science. Now, decision science is the use of those insights to make actionable decisions. How am I going to consume it? How am I going to get my business people involved in it? How am I going to create feedback loops? How am I going to create learning ecosystems in place? So all of that, which makes money, because without making money, it's going to become very, very hard to be sustainable. So you can be very passionate about what you do, but eventually you've got to be useful. And so that perspective of, uh, you know, um, you know, taking all of the, uh, you know, your purpose and passion to make profits is going to become, uh, you know, where decision science happens. I do like that um, analogy is uh, data is food. Uh, so yeah, <laughs> you've got a data analyst just like counting like all the all the different bits of things in in your fridge, and your decision scientist going, well, yeah, okay, uh, let's use those and uh, we'll make an omelet or something. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, okay, so I think um, one thing that's often tricky uh, with um, this idea of like uh, making better use of data is that the needs of different data different teams around data are very different. So uh, do you have any advice on like uh, how you make sure that every team uh, has uh, their needs adequately addressed? Uh, you know, um, you know the, the, the reality is that our organizations that we live in today um, have been built at an earlier time um, and um, and and at a time where execution was a lot more, you know, was a differentiating factor, right? And today we are living in a world where exploration is the differentiating factor, right? And the from that perspective, uh, what's happened is that most organizations are built as silos, 
there's a CEO under him, there are five or six or seven people under them, there are again seven or seven, seven people, and so on and so forth. And that's how the, it's a very hierarchical system that's built as a tree, uh, which is very unordered. It's a very ordered system. You know exactly what your uh, an organizational tree is very ordered. But the problem space is not so ordered, right? The problem space is a spaghetti. Things, everybody is talking to everybody and so on and so forth. So you have an ordered tree, which is trying to solve a very, very unordered, disordered, chaotic problem space, right? So that's where the problem actually starts, right? So the first thing we find in many of these organizations is that they're all operating in the silos. So there's a lack of transparency of all of the content, right? Um, things are sitting in one end, other people are not able to see it and so on and so forth. There's a lack of pers persistence in the conversations. And eventually, there is a lack of cumulativeness of all the work that you do. So you land up doing anecdotal project to project analytics and not programmatic decision sciences. So moving from project to project analytics and programmatic decision sciences means that you will need the ability to solve for the lack of transparency of the content. You will need an ability to solve for the lack of persistence in the conversation. So you need to have a, 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 a neat way to capture that persistence. And last but not the least, you need an industrial kitchen in place so that eventually all of this work becomes cumulative and you're not doing the same work again and again and so on and so forth. So we are in the early days of decision sciences, guys. And, uh, you know, all of the things that we did with data was just, you know, getting us to this part of this early days of decision sciences. So that's how I would look at it. Um, that's fascinating because it sort of feels like data science as a field is kind of uh, is starting to mature. But you're saying decision scientists, decision sciences are a lot newer and it's still got uh, a long way to go. Uh, that's interesting. So um, I think related to this idea there's this um concept of sort of self-service analytics where anyone in your organization can ask questions about data and answer it themselves and this seems like the, the holy grail for uh analytics rather than just having to send everything to a data team so do you have any advice on how you can make people self-sufficient in terms of using data i think um as you know look today's technologies um cater to a very federated approach. The more, the better it is if your decision happens at the edge, because then you can operate faster as a company. We are living in a world which is moved from bigger is better to faster is better. We are living in a world which is moved from competing on economies of scale to competing on economies of speed. We are living in a world which used to make products and services, but wants to make experiences right now. The science of experience and the science of interactions are one and the same. So your ability to look at problem solving as interactions become very, very, very important, right? So from that perspective, if you can, uh, you know, if you can operate with this perspective that look, um, uh, whatever I do, is good, but how I collaborate with my teammates is going to be that much more important. So that's going to make that journey move faster and faster towards decision sciences, right? So, so having this perspective of having a centralized group, which focuses on building a kitchen, but having a federated group, which does a lot of self-service, which can, uh, or semi-self-service, uh, is going to become very, very important. And I wouldn't, um, I would be very, very cautious with building tools that don't change often enough because the world outside is changing really, really fast, right? So if you built a tool and you built a self-service tool and it's working very wonderfully for you now, but doesn't mean that it'll work six months from now. So I would keep, uh, I, would, I would call, I would do something called optimal completion. Optimal completion is you completed 80%, but leave 20% flexible, which allows you to, kind of, uh, uh, you know, always customize your uh, end. Um, so that's going to be very, very important. I think in the future, I don't, everybody at some level will be a decision scientist, um, you know, and will be playing with data. I mean, like uh, my grandfather used to be a typist uh, at Times of India. 
uh, it's a newspaper, right? Today, there is no role called typist. All of us type, right? And that's what the future will be. All of us will have this thing called data science and decision science in us. We won't be so special by being a data scientist anymore. I mean, that's that's how that's my perspective. That's the future I see. Um, that's absolutely fascinating, I, and I agree with you that a lot of these uh, roles are changing, and you know, different technology sort of means that uh, your actual job contents can be uh, uh, very different. So. You mentioned that um, speed is incredibly important now, maybe like uh, what the most important um, factor driving business. So when I think of um, working with data, it's uh, to make decisions. It's about uh, thinking carefully and make and uh, there's a sort of pause for thought. So it's about slowing things down. So how do you reconcile that? How do you make sure that you can use data to make decisions without slowing down? Actually. Um there are certain parts of the problem solving that requires slowing down. Um, and I believe that if you can choose those parts very carefully and slow down in those parts, eventually you will be faster in the longer approach. So there's a very nice book by Kahneman and Drevisky uh, uh, written called Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, which is a... Um, which kind of gives you this perspective of system one and system two of your brain and so on and so forth. But uh, I would encourage you to look at that book. But my perspective is, you know, the design phase of the problem solving requires you to slow it down. Uh, then the second part of it is that, you know, before you start playing with data, you need to have a, a better structure and hypothesis established because once data comes in, it will lead you. So after that, you know, you start getting led constantly. Um, so that's very, very important that you kind of practice, um, you know, putting a structure in place and designing, having a good design in place. Design thinking is going to be a very big part um, you know, of decision science. So, so the way the components of decision science, I feel, are math for sure, understanding of business, use of technology, but also behavioral science and design thinking, uh, and a whole host of other things which I I cannot I don't even know about as much now, but will become important. Uh, you know, I, you know, taking the food analogy, little uh, you know, older cultures will always have more and more complex food. If you notice, you know. Uh, you know, uh, as, uh, and that and that's a very uh, perspective of the fact that just by giving having more time allows that food to mature and become more and more interesting. Similar to that, I think as we are going from data engineering to it becoming data science to it becoming decision science, right? Uh, more complexity is coming into that uh, solution into the problem solving space. Um. Uh, that's excellent stuff. Uh, so uh, we've got about 10 minutes left. So before we wrap up, I would like to talk a bit about um, skills. And can you tell me what sort of data skills do you think everyone in your organization needs to have, like even if they don't have data in their job title? Uh, I think it's it's very hard for me to answer that in the next five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, but what we can do for people here is that they would... Um, you know, maybe we will, uh, we have a section of our website, which is called Music by as a university. Um, in a world where many, bis many universities have become a business, we are a business that kind of runs as a university. 14,500 people have gone through Music Ma um, while they are studying. So what we can do is put a curriculum out there and share it with Data Camp. And that kind of gives you a kind of a guidance towards what, what kind of skills are happening right now and how it's going to change and so on and so forth. So we're more than happy to do that for you guys. Wonderful. Thank you. And as well, related to that, are there any skills that you think are particularly important for uh, learning how to make better decisions with data? Um, I, I think this perspective of uh, understanding cognitive biases uh, is going to become very, very important. The second thing uh, that's going to become more and more important is this area of complexity science. Um, um, in other words, the science of interactions, uh, you know, understanding the difference between what is simple versus what is complicated and what is complex. And not getting simplistic becomes very, very important in that journey. Um, you know, sometimes you could you could say a few cute words in a meeting and get away with it. 
uh, and look smart. Uh, but that's a very simplistic approach to life. Long term, you won't be able to create value that way. So, um, so, so understanding complexity science is going to be very important uh, and, and all these other aspects. Absolutely. I, I completely agree that the idea of understanding bias is incredibly important to uh, making good decisions. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, before we go to audience questions, I guess, uh, do you have any final advice for people wanting to get better at uh, data driven decision making within their organization? I just be a learner um, and don't expect any teachers. Um, be, you know, we are living in a world where all of us are students together. Um, so um, learn from wherever possible, um, you know. And the second thing is, um, you know, we, we are moved into a world of where exploration, um, you know, has become very, very important. And creating optionality for your organizations is extremely important. Now, if you're in that kind of world, you have to be comfortable, um, you know, in taking risks and having, you know, a clarity, uh, you know, of, uh, you know, of the problem space becomes very, very important. Um, so that, so our perspective has been that in the past, it was all about reducing variation, reducing sigma. Right, it was you want to have a certain amount of uh, certain average mu, and you want to reduce the sigma. That was the world of the past. If you look at a factory model, uh, you know, if if you're making iPhones, you want to make sure they are a certain quality. And, you know, that was the world before. But a world of exploration, you may want to increase sigma, because uh, you may want to have more options and then choose from those options. If you have five options to choose from, you're better off than you know, just one, two or three options. So I think that our, as decision scientists, your perspective should be to mute, seek sigma and sigmax yourself. So that's how I would look at it. That's a very nerdy way to end this, but yeah. But that's who. <laughs> no, I like that. Uh, yeah, if you get to make decisions, you want to have a few options to choose between. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, all right. So uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, we're going to go to audience questions in a moment. Before we get to that, I want to say we've got a load of uh, exciting webinars coming up. So tomorrow uh, we've got um, a code along session uh, on data storytelling. So you're going to work through uh, a problem uh, related to uh, environmentally friendly businesses. Um, so no coding experience required for that. And then next week on Tuesday, we've got uh, more uh data storytelling so there's a session on effective data storytelling for financial services and then uh you've got me talking about uh, chat gpt enterprise on wednesday and me again on uh thursday where we're going to do um a code along on uh working with uh, the open ai api uh, playing about with gpt and whisper so you can uh, mess about with uh, some uh uh, audio files and then on friday next week uh, we've got another code along uh, this is one uh, in spreadsheets uh, you can do some exploratory data analysis so lots of sessions for you to join go to datacamp.com slash webinars to sign up all right uh, with that uh, we've got a few minutes left let's go to audience questions and the first question is from uh, Ferris. So uh, Ferris asks, uh, sometimes there are different points of view when looking at data and trying to understand it. Uh, are there any criteria to help us understand it in a better way? So I think, uh, how do you resolve different points of view uh, when looking at data? I think uh, this aspect of triangulation is going to be very, very important. Um, we practice something called dialoguing. There's a big difference between discussions and dialogue. Uh, the word dialogue, many people misunderstand it, thinking that it's just a conversation between two people. Uh, that's not true. Dialogue is um, dia, which is via, um, and logos, which is truth. How, what's the path towards truth? So that's what it is. And a dialoguing perspective needs you to have, um, needs you to be able to, sus first thing you need to be able to do is suspend your uh, assumptions, suspend your beliefs when you're getting into that conversation. The second perspective is, um, you know, have multiple perspectives and be able to put all of that and triangulate around that. And the third is have kind of the ability to moderate so that, um, you know, whenever the dialogue is turning into a discussion of between me versus you and my point versus your point, 
you need to bring it back to this perspective. And that's very, very important in today's politics also. You're seeing that uh, there is a polarization in our world where things are, you know, me versus you. Uh, but what about us is the question. Because in the end of the day, it's about us. Uh, and that perspective of bringing that coming together will need an approach to dialoguing. Uh, yeah, certainly having that uh, conversation seems incredibly important. So, uh, yeah, you don't get anything resolved unless you talk about it with your with your colleagues. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, next question comes from Alex saying, is the methodology available? So this question came from uh, when you were talking about the difference between the uh, the bottom up and the top down methodologies. So uh, yeah. when you were sharing it, your screen. Uh, yeah, it's available uh, and it's uh, you should be able to look at it. We are actually practicing it in more than 140 Fortune 500 customers. So if you're one of those customers, you will have access to it. Uh, if you're not one of those customers, you should, uh, I think you should go to our website and look it up. And, um, you know, uh, we, we not only have a methodology, but also have software. So, uh, which is an industrial kitchen. Um, so, so our perspective was that we thought of it, not, that the future is not, a Superman model where you have the special guy who comes and does everything from Krypton. But it's not the robot also where everything is a machine. It's more the Iron Man model. So what we showed you was the Jarvis, the Iron Man suit, which anybody can enter and become an, an, an Iron Man. That's cool. Uh, I would definitely like one of those, uh, those Iron Man suits. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so, oh, uh, I don't think we have any more questions um, lined up So, uh, from the audience. So I have one very final question before we finish. Um, it's just, is there anything uh, exciting that you're working on at New Sigma that you want to tell us about? There's so many different things. We are solving an issue of non-normal distributions for an insurance company, how macroeconomic factors affect store profitability, the cure of cancer for a, using for a pharma company, um, you know, uh, uh, how, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, technology companies can be thinking about, uh, you know, product engineering better. So uh, uh, over, you know, 12 different industry verticals, we are solving problems in sales and marketing and supply chain and product risk, all of those kind of things. At any point of time, we would be solving about 1,500 to 2,000 problems for these 140 Fortune 500 clients. So we are a big nerd shop. Uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. That's a, that's a lot of problems uh, with data at any one time. All right, brilliant. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Diraj. Uh, that was really informative stuff. Uh, really great things uh thank you also to reese for moderating thank you to everyone who asked a question thank you to everyone who showed up today i hope to see you all again in future webinars all right goodbye thank you